Ladies and gentlemen, this talk is about 50 years of Unix and Linux, a computer odyssey, and why it's very important. First of all, my lawyers tell me that I have to remind people that Unix is a trademark of the Open Group. And actually, Linux is a trademark of Linus Torvalds. And we protect it freely for people to use it freely for any legitimate purpose. From time to time, you'll see a picture of the little beer bug on there. That is an indication that that particular topic is actually going to uh, be much greater depth and that you have to take me out for beer to hear about it. Because I am really old. This year I am 68 years old. I'm diabetic, I've had two heart attacks. I only have about 50% of my heart left. But I've been programming since 1969. And you're going to see that's a very interesting year for a lot of things which have happened. I've been programming on Linux since 1994 when I first met Linus Torvalds. I've worked for a lot of college companies and small companies. But most of all, I like to think I'm pragmatic, which means Linux is not a religion for me. It's something, it's a tool to do some work. And I hope that you all enjoy that. And I'm going to be going both through 50 years of history in a 50-minute talk. And my memory isn't what it used to be. Now, if you've been along, alive as long as I have, maybe you'll remember history a different way. But when you have your talk, you can talk about your history. So we're going to go through the anniversaries of this year. Because we've had 20 years of the Linux Terminal Server project, which we'll hear about more later on and 20 years of the Linux Professional Institute, of which I am the chairman of the board. We do certification for open source professionals. So if you'd like to get a job, you can get a Linux Professional Institute certification that's recognized in 180 countries around the world, and you'll join 150,000 other certified professionals. It's 25 years of version 1.0 of the Linux kernel. Now, for those of you that do not produce software, what version 1.0 means is it means it gets to the point where it's actually useful to somebody. And in May of 1994, version 1.0 of the Linux kernel was released, and a lot of distributions started up. Beowulf supercomputers were started in 1994, along with most of the major distributions. This year is 30 years of the World Wide Web. Tim Berners-Lee started it in 1989. And in 1989, the Unix license plate, which itself is a story, was created. But this is 50 years, 50 years from 1969, when people we're walking on the moon. And it was also the 50th year that the Woodstock riot, I'm sorry, the Stonewall Inn riots happened, which started the LGBTQ movement. It's 50 years since Woodstock, the music festival in the United States that had a lot of artists become recognized. And in New Jersey in 1969, the Unix operating system was created. The internet was born as something called the ARPANET in 1969. And Linus Torvalds was born in December the 15th of 1969. So Linus is 50 years old this year, which makes me feel incredibly old. I wrote my first program in 1969, and 1969 was the last year that I ever shaved. So we have a lot of anniversaries here, and I'm going to take you back to the very beginning, at least for me, when mainframe computers like this one on the screen would cost two and a half million US dollars. 
And the, the, the cabinets were so big, you could actually walk into the cabinets and store things in there. However, logically, these computers were still very small because you had memories that were measured in kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes, but kilobytes. And disks were measured in megabytes. I still remember the first hard disk I ever had in my workstation. It was five megabytes in size. And you fought to get the 10 megabyte disk because you could do so much with that. Programs were run one at a time. And if we go back and take a look at that computer, you see all sorts of switches and lights on it. Why don't we see switches and lights on the front of our computers today? It's because we're running so many programs in them at one time, we can't tell what switch or what light is with which program. And if the computer had an operating system, it typically ran one program at a time. It was more like an Arduino uh, uh, loading and, and executing the program. There were specialized operating systems, batch operating systems, time-sharing operating systems, real-time operating systems. And there was an urban myth, an urban myth that says that computer companies wrote different operating systems to lock their customers into their hardware. Now, I was a programmer back then. I sat in some of those meetings. We never talked about that. All we talked about was how we could make our computer system more efficient for our customers to solve a particular type of problem. Because when your computer is executing 100,000 instructions a second with a memory size that is a quarter of a megabyte and the thing costs two and a half million dollars, you want to try and help your customer be efficient. And if we wanted to lock people into using our system, then the PDP-11, a very famous computer system, one of the ones that Unix first ran on, would not have needed 11 different operating systems to do that. It only would have needed one. But we had 11 because the operating system fit the customer's needs. Now also in that time, most software was distributed in source code form. Because unlike today, you didn't have one architecture that there were millions or even billions of systems running you didn't have one operating system. You may, a company would feel lucky if they would produce and sell a thousand systems. And so there really wasn't any real need to create binary only software. There were also very few professional programmers. If you wrote code, you wrote it for your own use. You're a physicist, and you are writing code to solve physics problems. You're a chemist, and you're writing code to solve chemical problems, and so forth and so on. You didn't write code for other people. As a matter of fact, I had a professor tell me one time in college, Mad Dog, you'll never be able to learn, earn a living as a professional programmer. And I'm still waiting to find out if he was right or not. There were no software copyrights or patents. Those didn't happen until around 1986 when games came out and you had a ROM with binary bits in it and people wanted to copyright the ROM so that their competitors could not copy that. So back in those days, you shared your software in bulletin boards or in user groups or things like that so that other people could take advantage of your software because selling software is very hard. You have to write documentation, you have to have warranties, you have to have support. And the people that wrote software were not in that business. They were physicists and chemists and educators. But in 1969, two guys in Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, decided that they would like to write a little operating system just for fun. It was a research group. They didn't have to have a reason for doing what they were doing. They just 
started writing it, and they believed that they were going to do it right. Originally, the, the software was written for a PDP-7 computer, written in assembly language, and they didn't even have an assembler on the PDP-7 to do the assembly. So they had to do a cross-assembly from another computer system, punching it onto binary tape, and carrying it to the PDP-7 to run. And then they would use the switches and the lights on the front console to do Uh-oh. Oh, to debug their system. There we go. Uh, eventually, Dennis Ritchie said, this is too much like work. And he decided to write a language called C, and they rewrote the kernel completely in C to be able to make it easier to write. And as they did that, it eventually, it, the operating system itself became portable across different types of platforms. And so they had to write less and less of the operating system each time as they took it to a different platform. And Ken Thompson liked to go to universities and talk to them about writing operating systems. And he would carry his source code or his magnetic tape under his arm. And he would go to government uh, agencies and share his code with them. But it was never free. The concept that Unix was free to universities, that was just not true. It was always licensed, and if the universities were found distributing it to other people, they could get fined. In fact, the source code license for AT&T Unix was $160,000, and remember, this is 1969, per CPU. And not only that, but you had to tell them what the serial number of your computer was. Now, without looking, how many of you know the serial number of your laptop? Ah, that's what I thought. You're slackers. Hmm. That deserves a penguin. So people don't know what the serial number of their laptop is. I don't know. But this was the first time that the portability of operating system and programs and humans across different vendors' computers was allowed. And it was, it was thought of that now, because computers were faster and cheaper, that actually humans were more viable than computers for the first time. And they were just doing it for fun. Now, the contributions of Unix are quite a number of them. First of all, there's the portability of the kernel itself, where a lot of the functionality of the operating system was outside the kernel. It was in what they called user space. And the kernel was relatively small. A lot of people today talk about micro kernels and things like that, and, the, and that Unix and Linux are typically thought of as a, as a monolithic kernel. But still, when you think of the thousands of interfaces that are outside of the kernel in user space, it really is kind of a micro kernel. The shell, as a separate process, a separate program running in user space, was also a unique idea. And out of that, the concept of pipes and filters, where the output of one program goes into the input of the other, was such a unique concept that Douglas McElroy, the person who came up with it, had to write the first Unix commands to show to Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson what he was talking about. Portable network file systems like NFS came out of Unix. And the X Windows system as a client server type of windowing system also came from MIT Project Athena based on Unix. And there were many more contributions to computer science that came out of the Unix system. But in 1982, a company called Sun Microsystems decided they wanted to build this little computer that they got from Stanford University, and they wanted to have an operating system to put on top of it. They went to several different companies. They even came to digital and tried to buy VMS from us. Fortunately, they didn't get VMS. 
But instead, they went to Berkeley and got a copy of Berkeley Unix, which by that time was a very powerful version of Unix that was produced by Berkeley. And they went to AT&T and they said, we're not going to deliver this in source code. We're only going to give out binaries. Could you give us a cheaper license? And more importantly, not make us tell you the serial numbers of the computers. And AT&T said, sure. We'll let you have a two-user license and an unlimited user license. And the unlimited user license was only $350 as opposed to $160,000. Now, most of you might think two users, that's kind of a strange number. Why would you have a two user license? Well, you're logged in, so you're one user, but then the networking you want to use called UUCP also has to log in, and that's a second user. Or maybe you need the root operator or the root su the super user to log in also, and that would be two users. So that's why a single user system needed to have a two user license. And other companies started to follow this. Digital Equipment Corporation, Hewlett Packard, IBM, all with their different versions of Unix. Most of them used the Berkeley distribution. Because out of the two distributions, System 5 that came from Bell Laboratories and BSD as they called it, coming from Berkeley, System 5 was a swapping system. It did not use demand page virtual memory. And so the size of your largest program was more or less limited to the size of your largest memory in your system. They only gave you two compilers, C and Fortran 77. And most importantly for a lot of people, their networking was called Unix to Unix copy, which used serial telephone lines and it was a store and forward system. Berkeley had demand page virtual memory. So your, your, the size of your program could be 32 bits in size even if you had a small physical memory. They included three compilers, C, Fortran 77, and Pascal, and, but they also had TCP IP. And that was very important for people to want to put up local area networks inside of their companies or universities. And so most people went with BSD. But the problem with BSD was the University of California had no marketing budget. They couldn't go out and rent a two-page ad every week in Computer World magazine saying that Berkeley Unix was the right choice. But AT&T could. And so this battle between the two systems came about. Of course, there's one person that was not, didn't like this very much. He was a student at MIT, and his name was Richard Stallman. He didn't like the fact he could no longer get the source code. He didn't like the fact he couldn't see how the system worked. He didn't like the fact he couldn't easily add device drivers to it. And so he started a project called GNU, which stands for GNU is not Unix. And his intent was to write a complete operating system distributed in source code form, absolutely free. Free as in money and free as in beer. He started with Emacs. I'll get to that in a moment. He started the, the GNU project in 1983 and in 1985, he started the Free Software Foundation to help to fund it. Now, he started from the top down. This made a lot of sense. If the first thing he had ever written was the kernel, then he would have had nothing to run on top of it. And by the time he had something to run on top of it, his kernel would be old. So instead, he started writing things that all programmers could use. And the very first thing he wrote was Emacs which is a text editor. And you had the same Emacs whether you worked on VMS or whether you worked on Unix or whether you worked on other proprietary systems, which is very nice for programmers. Some people say that he could have stopped with Emacs because Emacs does so many things, it's like running an operating system. 
Then he wrote a compiler suite called the Gnu Compiler Suite. And he started to write other utilities. And people joined him in this project. And this allowed programmers to be portable across the different operating systems. It also allowed a lot of small companies to start up because they could take the software written by the Free Software Foundation and supply support for it. Sometimes all they did was prepackage all the source code that the GNU project created, and they put out CDs for it. Sometimes they sold books about the software, like O'Reilly did. And sometimes they started support companies like Cygnus, which gave support to the GNU compilers, to companies like Boeing and others. And these little companies thrived. My company, Digital Equipment Corporation, have been supporting Unix for many years on our PDP-11 and VAX computers, but only from a hardware sense. And when I joined in 1983, we started to write our own Unix systems, which we called Ultrix. Ultrix 11 for 16-bit computers like the PDP-11, and Ultrix 32 for 32-bit computers like the VAX. Now the Unix wars started up, and many of the vendors mostly sold to scientific and technical audiences, which composes about 16% of the market, software development and education. But the commercial market, which was 84% of the computer market, was mostly maintained by proprietary systems, mainframes, and others, like VMS. Databases like Oracle and others would use raw petitions to store their data because they didn't trust the Unix file system to hold the data, and they needed to have synchronous rights to be able to put the data out on the disk before they went on. There was a war that started up between Unix system labs, represented by Sun and AT&T, and this is where Sun moved from their Berkeley base that they called Sun OS onto their System 5 base, which they called Solaris. And the first version of Solaris that came out was so bad that we called it Slowlaris. In other words, it was really slow. DEC, IBM, and others formed the Open Software Foundation, and they set up a set of standard APIs application programming interfaces for people to write to and for operating systems to support. And if your operating system supported those interfaces and if it passed tests, then you could call your system Unix. And a lot of people did that and branded their systems as Unix. And I am going to give another win win. Okay. Now, in 1991, Unix System Labs and AT&T sued a little company called BSDI. BSDI was started by a bunch of people who started the, the, the BSD operating system, and they sold their binaries and sources for a total of 995 US dollars, about $1,000. This lawsuit dragged on for years and years. Finally, BSDI was put out of business, but other companies took this up. And eventually, all of the, of the AT&T code was removed from BSD, creating a distribution called BSD Lite. And this is the basis, became the basis for FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and NetBSD. However, in 1991, this lawsuit was still not settled. And a young man in Helsinki, Finland, decided he was going to write a kernel that would support all of the, BS all of the GNU software that Richard Stallman had created. And it wasn't just the GNU software, but it was software from MIT, some software from BSD, and other pieces of software, as well as databases and a whole series of other things. And this, of course, became Linux, or GNU Linux, as Richard Stallman likes to call it. But why was this possible at this time? Why didn't people do this before? 
And one of the reasons for that is that powerful, cheap computers not only had come into the marketplace with the 386, but were actually getting old. So you didn't mind using your old 386 computer that supported demand page virtual memory to help develop this new kernel called Linux. And once you had had that done, you could then use it to do other things around the house. There was also faster internet to the home. It was no longer over the twisted pair of wires coming into your house. You could get cable modems. You could get DSL modems to bring this faster internet in because you typically wanted to do this work in your home, not at work or even at the university. There was also a lot of information, papers, things like Minix available online, so you could look at how other people had developed operating systems and put this into this new kernel, Linux. And in 1989, the World Wide Web was maturing. It had even gone beyond the fact of just being used for porn. So you could do interesting things with it. So in 1994, a lot of the system vendors, except for Sun Microsystems, had given up on Unix on the desktop. They had ceded this over to Microsoft and Windows NT. They said, OK, Windows NT on the desktop, or Windows on the desktop, and Unix in the servers in the, in the main room. Now, I don't blame these people for doing this. I don't blame O'Reilly, for instance, for stopping publishing Unix books and starting to publish books on Windows NT and Microsoft because he had a company to support. He had people who depended on him. However, I will point this out because a lot of these people who call themselves the saviors of Linux had actually turned their backs on Unix at that time. But I met Linus Torvalds in, in Dicus in May of 1994. And I saw Linux for the first time. Now, there are two adult Disneylands in the United States. If you ever go there, you should go to these adult Disneylands. Skip the one in Orlando. But the two adult Disneylands are Las Vegas and New Orleans. And you can get anything you want in New Orleans and a lot of things you don't want. But it's a fun place to go. And I took Linus out, and we took him up in the Natchez, took him up and down the river, giving him hurricanes. Now, hurricanes are an alcoholic drink. And after you've had one of them, you feel like you've been hit by Katrina. And I made sure that Linus had enough hurricanes. And at the end of the trip, I said to him, Linus, have you ever thought about putting Linux on a 64-bit computer? And one, that's a risk architecture to get all the Intoisms out of the kernel. He said, well, yes, I had thought about that, but it's been very hard to get an alpha system from digital, so I may have to do the PowerPC instead. Ah! And I dropped my hurricane, and I never drop a drink. So I went running back to my office, and I got Linus an alpha system sent to his house in Helsinki, Finland. And I got DEC to supply us with some engineers to do some of the lower level work. And then I started to learn the power of the, <laughs> the power of the Linux and FOSS community. And GNU Linux exploded. We didn't have any applications at first, but we found out that there's a lot of people that only needed the bare underpinnings of Unix and Linux systems. People who were ISPs providing shell accounts to people and the fledgling web servers to come up and be able to be executed at a fraction of the cost of a Spark Solera system. And databases started porting in 1998, Informix and Oracle and others. 
And having brought out a lot of systems, I knew this was a sign that Linux was going to be popular. And in the year 2000, embedded systems started using Linux, and it was the most used operating system in new embedded system designs. Supercomputers in 1994 were having problems <laughs> because you would build a supercomputer and very expensive to build a design and then you would sell five of them. One of them to agencies that we dare not say their name and the other four would go to universities who couldn't pay for them anyway. And companies like ECL and Cray were going out of business. And then two people at NASA Donald Becker and Dr. Thomas Sterling invented the concept of supercomputers to solve a very important set of problems called fluid dynamics. And believe me, fluid dynamics is every place. It is the most important type of processing you can do because it's the weather, it's the ocean currents, it has heat disposition. Everything is fluid dynamics, and we needed to be able to solve these problems very quickly and very cheaply. And so people using these supercomputers were able to solve these problems at one fortieth of the price that they had before. And inadvertently, I helped to influence this because in 1996, I went to Australia, and on my way, I stopped off in Hawaii to visit a friend of mine, and I gave a CD of Red Hat software to this young roommate of his, who later went to Los Alamos Laboratories and built the Loki system. And because of this, Red Hat software was used to route the National Laboratory System for Supercomputers. Today, all 500 of the fastest supercomputers in the world run Linux. The same Linux kernel that runs in your laptop, basically the same operating system that runs in your laptop. Two of them used to run Microsoft because Microsoft paid them to run it. But even then, they gave up. And here is the 1997 Gordon Bell Prize for supercomputing. Ironically, Gordon Bell at that time worked for Microsoft in their supercomputer labs. And every single one of the prizes on that form were Beowulf systems. Now we've been talking for a long time about the year of the Linux desktop. This is going to be the year of the Linux desktop. The Linux desktop is coming. And so is the penguin. But a lot of reasons that people have happened is a lot of them is inertia. People get used to using Windows, their parents use Windows, their partners use, people next door use Windows. And for a long time they memorized one set of keystrokes to get things done. But what broke that was browsers and cell phones and iOS and Android. And now people don't use their computers that way anymore because there's too many interfaces to write down in your little notebook. A second thing that keeps Linux off the desktop is lack of games. And fortunately, that is also disappearing now. We're getting more and more games on Linux. And people using game consoles instead of their PC for games. A lot of times people are looking for only five applications and four of those five are readily found, but the fifth one is hard to find. And so people developed a thing called the Linux Terminal Server Program that basically allows you to see your Linux system running on a server on top of your terminal. And this has saved certain companies millions and millions of dollars in Microsoft licenses. Now another threat to free software is Apple. Apple only has one customer, one partner, Apple. Apple is the only company that makes any money off of Apple, besides a few developers that sell things in Apple stores. 
But they did turn the computer from being a scientific, technical, or business device into being a consumer item with the iPad, the iPhone, and the i-everything. But Android foiled their plan because Android is now outselling Apple on a desktop and on the phones. And I predict that by the end of, this, of, the, of the decade, that Apple will end up with 7% of the market as a very profitable company, but Android will have all of the rest. And now we have the cloud. People come in and try and convince you to put things in the cloud. And the problem with that is that then now they're going to lease you all of your software forever. And you're not going to have any chance to really change it or fix it. They just keep leasing it to you. They may try and give you the illusion of privacy, but they can't give you privacy, not when they're up against people like the NSA or the CIA or other agencies like that. We, the open source community, need to take back the control of the cloud and do it ourselves. And particularly in a country like Brazil, you need to keep your data in Brazil. Don't send your data to the United States. So I'm going to sum up the history real quick. Unix was a system that created portable code and portable people and set the APIs for Linux in the future. Linux relit the desire of people to take control of your software, to be able to get the source code to change it with other people to fit your needs. And out of that came FOSS, free and open source software and hardware, and free culture, things like Creative Commons and exchange of data and text freely. And when I told people back in 1994 that I was going to take this path with my degree, with my career, they laughed at me. And now all those people who laughed at me work for IBM. So I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to talk about the future. We are users of GNU Linux, and some of you are developers and systems administrators who use it in your job. A lot of users do not care or know about freedom. It is up to us to educate them to the importance that it brings. A, a, a large binary only company has recently started saying that they love open source. But I point out to them there's three types of love. In the ancient Greek, there was agape, the love of God for humans, the love of mother for child, you know, that type of love, the all-seeing, the all-caring, the all-knowing love, the all-forgiving love, that's agape. There's also philos, brotherly love, the love of friends, the love that you have for your siblings. From that, we get Philadelphia, philosophy, philanthropy. And then there's Eros, the dirty love, the sexual love, the deepest, darkest, dirtiest love. And that is what this company has for open source. They have Eros. Don't bend over in the shower with them. We are close to world domination. Linux, the kernel, runs on all Android systems, which is outselling iOS. Linux is, work, is selling on more than 60% of the server systems we ship. If you use Google, if you use Facebook, you use Linux. We have to understand and publicize the business models for free software. We have to show people how they can make or save money with free software. We have to show them, we have to say to them, why are you sending billions of reais every year outside of Brazil to the United States, to Europe, to Redmond, Washington, to Silicon Valley, 
when those billions of reais should stay here in Brazil paying programmers like you, helping you start companies? And why should you be sending those billions of reais outside of Brazil to China to make computers that could be produced here? You're a country of 200 million people, half the population of the United States. You should be doing it here. Keep that money here. Develop the expertise here. Because developing the expertise here means that you can attract new companies to come to Brazil and start new businesses which you can export to other countries. You have to fight for this. Don't sit down and take it. So I am the chairman of the board of directors for Linux Professional Institute. If you become certified by us, you're recognized in 180 countries around the world. You can sell your services over the internet because you say, I've got certification from LPI, and they understand what that is. I am working with Caninos Locos. I've been coming here to Campus Party and talking to you about it for five years. The building of small computers here in Brazil that is equivalent, or better actually, than the Raspberry Pi, and a lot cheaper for you to buy than the Raspberry Pi. And tomorrow, at the University of Sao Paulo, we're going to be producing 20 of these on our line. And if we produce them with 100% accuracy, like we think we are, then we produce another 2,500 of them. And we are going to give these away for free to people who have ideas about how to use them, to people who will help us create the operating system to make it better and better. And then we're going to redesign them with a whole set of new components. USB 3.1, a whole set of new components, and then we're going to produce them by the hundreds of thousands. Caninos Lucos. I'm working on Project Kawa, a project to help young students afford university, because even though the tuition in Brazilian universities is free, 40% of the qualified students cannot afford to go because their parents cannot afford the apartment or the internet or the books or the transportation or the food. But with Project Kawan, they can work part-time in their field that they have chosen to make that money. And lastly, I'm working for an organization called WIT.com, and we're going to be producing completely open computer systems, laptops, amongst other things. So Caninas Lucas, that's the URL. You go to the site, find out about the little systems and what we're doing. We're working with BNDS to we're working with BNDS to form solutions for Internet of Things. And we're working with the university to a free course that you can take online to learn how to program and build Internet of Things products. I'm putting in a shameless plug right now. For, that should be DebConf, not DevConf. DebConf 2019, which is going to be held here in Brazil, in Curitiba. That's where I have my brew pub and my brew on premises place. You can come there, we have 29 beers on tap, all orders of beers, no skull, no Brahma, no, no, uh, nothing like that. You can meet my godson. And we're gonna have a great time there with Debian. And then finally, my last project, Mad Dog's Monastery and Marina, of math, music, microcomputing, microbrewing, microwinery, microdistillery, and bait shop, which I'll be opening in 2025. You're all welcome. <laughs> and we'll be doing free software there, of course.
And if you want to see the most important person in free and open source software and hardware, when you get up in the morning, take a look in the mirror. Thank you very much. <laughs>